this is Bob Scully and welcome to another edition of the World Show, the Free Markets series. Richard A. Epstein is an acclaimed professor of law at Stanford, at the University of Chicago, and more recently at NYU. He was voted one of America's most prominent legal thinkers by the readers of Legal Affairs magazine. But that didn't explain our interest in him this time. We wanted to ask him to reconcile libertarianism and the law, two things that generally don't seem to go together. Here's his answer. Professor Epstein, uh, libertarianism is, is a word that gets tossed around a lot these days, especially in, in an election year. It's got the word liberty in it, but it's not a synonym of liberty. What is it? Well, libertarianism is actually a complex set of beliefs of which liberty is one of its component parts. But if I had to sort of put it together, I would put it in the following way. I would say that personal liberty with respect to most matters, meaning that people get to do the kinds of choices they want and the activities they engaged in, is primarily limited by one principle, which is that you cannot use force, including all sorts of indirect force like nuisances against other individuals, and you can't lie in order to get your particular aims in dealing with contractual transactions. So essentially what it is, it's a regime that believes that strong property rights and freedom of contract subject to those constraints are going to produce the highest level of overall good. And the basic assumption behind that is actually a utilitarian one, which is when people enter into voluntary exchanges, both of them make themselves better off, so the presumption is they should be allowed to do what they please. It's also a theory of limited government, and that means, in effect, that the rules that you're trying to enforce are not self-enforcing. Uh, people will break prom promises. People will take other people's property if, in fact, they're not constrained. So what you do is you need to have a system of taxation which supports a state, which is designed to enforce the fundamental rights in question. That's one of the great functions of government. And there are also certain kinds of transactions that are sufficiently complicated that voluntary arrangements won't be able to work them, so that a system of regulation and a system of eminent domain should be imposed with one key condition, that the people who are subject to the taxes and to the eminent domain are given compensation either in cash or in other forms of benefits, such that they're at least as well off after they've been coerced as they were before. And so essentially a good libertarian philosophy has two components. One is it tries to push the state to support voluntary markets when they work. And secondly, it tries to institute a series of very complicated coerced transactions to improve overall welfare when market transactions are blocked by very high costs. And so that two-part program essentially shapes the way in which you ought to think. And, and there's that old saw uh, that we, uh, we hear uh, when people are arguing about their respective freedoms and somebody will say, well, my freedom begins where yours stops or, or yours begins where mine stops. Is that the same thing? Well, what happens is that there's always an egalitarian component in libertarianism because what you are talking about is a system which works for all people. So the constant refrain is speaking about the like liberties of all individuals. And it's not where my liberty begins and yours ends. Uh, the usual way is a bit more blunt. It says, you know, my liberty begins where my face begins and your fist has to keep off of it. And so what one's trying to do is to create a system of separate spheres for individuals. We start with respect to personal autonomy. That's why we have laws against murder and rape and theft. And then what we do is we start to expand that notion to cover various kinds of property arrangements uh, having to do, for example, with trespass laws. It's a relatively simple basic system, but to get it to work completely requires a lot more work than many libertarians themselves are willing to acknowledge. And, and one thing I've noticed uh, that comes up a lot in libertarian literature uh, is the importance of contracts and contract law and rule of law. And it kind of makes you wonder if um, even though libertarianism is about liberty and lots of it, uh, in fact, to make it work, you need strong laws, strong law enforcement, police, strong courts, jail sentences, all kinds of things which are really, in a sense, the antinomy of freedom. Well, they're not the antinomy of freedom. The hope is that if you could create a strong set of sanctions to deter people from violating the rules, uh, voluntary contracts will become more important, their breach will go down, and the number of intrusions that people make improperly against the property and lives of other individuals will be reduced. The major success of a libertarian theory of government doesn't rest in the cases that it actually solves, it rests in the silent portion of the arrangement, that is in the number of wrongs that it's able to prevent. Has, has libertarian uh, theory uh, 
ever enjoyed a golden moment in history? Has it ever been tried somewhere and worked? Well, uh, pure libertarian theories are extremely difficult to make work because they always are at clash with partisan politics of one kind or another. But it's certainly possible to find periods in which there's been a greater allegiance to libertarian ideas. And if you were to look at that in the United States, the period in question would probably be starting from about 1870 after the Civil War, running through about 1932, which is the beginning of the New Deal. And the period has often been reviled by progressives, but if you take simple measures like life expectancy and so forth, it's quite clear that the level of material progress in those eight years was far greater than it was in any of the periods that came before, and I dare say in many ways even in the years that started to follow it. And the question is, can you keep this libertarian or classical liberal vision alive? And you need a weak but sensible antitrust law. You need strong protection of property rights. You have to worry about such things as pollution, which require government kinds of control. But what you try, in effect, to avoid is a situation where you have high progressive taxes, very heavy barriers against free trade uh, moving in across countries, um, and the formation and the organization of government cartels and unions. And what happened at the end of the progressive era in the beginning uh, that is up to about 1932 in the New Deal, is all of a sudden the bad ideas started to take over. Agriculture became heavily cartelized. Strong mandatory unions became the order of the day. Uh, there was a real movement uh, with the Smoot-Hawley tariff in 1930 to prevent free trade. All of those things turned out to be a disaster. And in fact, one of the reasons why we have so much trouble in the last couple of years in the United States is that these same regressive policies are taking over real hostility uh, towards free trade, very strong efforts to sort of tax the rich, powerful limitations on freedom of contract, all of these things combined together to create, I think, an unsupportable equilibrium because you cannot run a government where you have more and more transfer payments um, taken out of the highs of fewer and fewer individuals. You, you bring that up in your writings that there, we may be uh, living through something that is an echo of the 30s and yet the truism these past few years, the reassuring sort of common wisdom has been that no, 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 um, we know now how bad Smoot Hawley was and we're not going there again with excessive protectionism. It'll never happen again. Um, but, but you say that's not so. Well, no. What happens is the, the reason why the world is so difficult is that politics uh, gives a great series of targets for people to get regulations and taxation which work for their private interests but which essentially diminish the prosperity of a nation as a whole. And there's no group which is immune from these kinds of favoritisms. You could get bailouts for large financial corporations and business corporations. You could get strong unions. The agricultural sector has been rife with respect to this kind of petty protectionism. So the difficulty is there's simply no class of individuals whom you could say at every time and at all times are good guys. And that's why you need folks like me, the professors of this world. Our job is to try to figure out in any particular dispute who's wearing the white hat and who's wearing the black one. And, and I was sort of fantasizing about what it might be like if, if you did have a libertarian society. And I thought, well, um, politicians like to make promises and legislators like to legislate and people like to hear promises. And when there's a controversy, everybody demands an immediate solution. So it wouldn't be long before human nature being what it is that you'd have regulation once again and, and you'd be back to the old systems. Well, re-regulation is a very important phenomenon. You get an industry which is relieved from its regulations, and then either there's some people inside the industry who would like you to regulate their competitors, or you turn the thing around and an industry starts to be prosperous and other people want to put restrictions on them so that they can survive. And the whole theory of good government is to develop a theory of regulation which allows those regulations which essentially produce across the board improvements and to ban those which are strictly partisan. So to give you a kind of an example with respect to real estate, um, you don't want to have a zoning system which makes one person keep his land basically empty while somebody else could build a powerful business across the street because of the huge skew. But on the other hand, you certainly need to have taxation and perhaps some zoning ordinances so as to make sure that you could have suitable roads and sewers and so forth so that the common elements of the system could be organized. To put it very simply, I, I sometimes 
fantasize about a course I'd like to teach called Law and Geometry. And basically the pattern ought to be this, where you have square things, those ought to be privately owned and devoted to production, but you need to have long and skinny things like wires and roads and pipes and so forth which link people together. Generally speaking, private markets don't work very well with these long, thin connective tissues, but they work very well in trying to allow people to organize productions on squares. That's why when you look at public roads, you don't allow people to put their verandas out, to put their chairs out and sit on the middle of the highway. They're only used for one purpose and one purpose only. Now, you're a distinguished professor of law. You teach all this. Don't you think that for, for libertarianism to have any kind of a chance in future law schools, uh, a libertarian point of view should be one of the courses uh, so the judges uh, in later years think of these things because right now the kind of concerns that you express are not the ones that come up in judgments. Well, I, I mean, my view is that everybody has to understand the basic principles of political economy in order to be able to deal with the kinds of problems that they're going to face. So when you teach a class, it's always a delicate balancing act. On the one hand, you're trying to teach enduring principles, and on the other hand, you're trying to show how they apply to contemporary situations. So when I teach a class, for example, in torts, the first case I often teach is a case from 1466, dealing with the rules of trespass when one person cuts thorns which land on somebody else's land, and the question is how you untangle this forced interaction between two people. And then at the end of the term, we're starting to talk about the way in which when you deal with drugs and new kinds of therapies and medical devices, what are the liabilities that ought to be imposed upon the manufacturers and the physicians and technicians who use them. And if you get it right, there's going to be a coherent line that goes from the 1466 case of the Thorns to the modern cases dealing with uh, preemption and federal control, either in the United States or in Canada, of these various kinds of devices. Among the many uh, papers you wrote that I read, because uh, you're very prolific, uh, I could follow the libertarian philosophy throughout your demonstration of this problem or that problem. But one thing that really uh, stunned me, really caught my eye and, and, and left me wondering is when you say that it's a natural derivative of, of uh, libertarianism um, not to help somebody in danger. And in fact, in France or in the civil code up, up, in, up here in Canada and Quebec um, and in many countries in Europe, there are precisely laws that say it's a duty to help somebody in mortal danger. They can actually accuse you of a crime if you, if you don't do it. Um, and that sounds like a pretty good thing. Um, why doesn't that fit with libertarianism? Oh, oh that, that's, the, the utilitarian questions and the Good Samaritan questions are classics in the law. Uh, and the first point that one wants to make is if you go back to the major postulate, it starts talking about the prevention of force and fraud. And the reason why that's so important is if there's one person in the world who wants to deceive you or to maul you, the fact that other people are going to be nice to you doesn't matter. When you start dealing with rescues, the situation turns out to be a little bit different. If you're a person in distress, there are thousands sometimes people who can literally help you, and you're going to get a much better set of relationships if the persons who really care about helping are the one who are going to do it. So within the libertarian tradition, there's a theory of what is known as imperfect obligations, which means that those people who have substantial amount of wealth should either by reasons of conscience or social pressure decide to devote some portion of that wealth to those who are less fortunate themselves but to pick whom they want to help and to do it well. And when you start talking about the really dramatic cases like the rescue, this is what the, the lay of the land is. Without any legal compulsion together in the United States today, uh, the greatest risk of rescue is not that people will stand aside when just by throwing a rope over this edge they could save somebody who's drowning. People will just do that out of a sense of empathy and decency. The real danger is that they'll kill themselves trying to make futile rescues. And in fact, one of my colleagues, uh, a professor at the University of Illinois, David Hyman, went through every one of the rescue cases he could find and found only one or two not documented instances of gross indifference in the face of need, but found hundreds of cases where heroic rescues failed and ended up killing people who might have otherwise lived. So you don't want to use legal compulsion when that's the case. Now, in the United States... But you, you don't want to give the cowards an excuse either. Uh, nobody likes a captain who, who won't go down with his ship. Yeah, well, I mean, but no, you see, that's not a stranger case. When you're talking about the captain, he's got real contractual duties with respect to the people. 
um, that he's trying to serve on the boat. So the technical definition of the duty of rescue is there's somebody with whom you have no prior connection. And the question that you have to ask is you have to go dive in after him when there's nothing that otherwise previously bound you. And one of the reasons why these cases are not all that important is that if we know that there's serious risks, we develop contractual institutions which get rid of the need to throw the burden on strangers. So you go to a breach, you have a bunch of lifeguards out there who hired to do just what you want them to do, namely to rescue. If you find somebody falling on the street, you call the, e, you know, the EMT, the emergency medical technologist and so forth, and you bring them in. Uh, there is a statute in the United States in Vermont, passed about 40 odd years ago, which imposed a duty of rescue subject to a hundred dollar fine. Every time when I revise a casebook that I prepare on the law of torts, I want to see if there are anybody who's ever sued under that statute. And the answer every year is the same. They're essentially dead letters. Keep a strong set of cultural norms going, and the rescue problem will take care of itself. Keep a strong set of cultural norms going, it will certainly ease the problem of criminal behavior. But if there's one person who's recalcitrant and and obdurate. That person can kill lots of people, which is why it is that we need to use force in order to control force. But we don't need to use force in order to encourage benevolence. So, for instance, in that infamous case in China, the recent case where a child was, was, was uh, hurt, uh, hit by a truck, I believe, and uh, a, truck, a truck ran over him and people were walking by and nobody cared, um, and they could see him in that position, um, that is scandalous, but should not be made illegal. Well, in, in a case like China, it's such a complicated country. I was there um, last October, and one of the things that you noted was there was a kind of a brutish culture when you got on the public streets. Everybody was kind of pushing and shoving to get a little bit further ahead of themselves. And I was not surprised to hear that the story took place there. I mean, they have a long way to go in order to soften the edges of a strong form of entrepreneurial individualism. And one of the things I think that a careful libertarian philosophy is always prepared to stress is that just because there are things that are legal as a matter of law does not mean that there are things that are legal or sensible rather as a matter of humanity. And there's a large class of what we call moral obligations that people should try to encourage in others and try to observe by themselves. And if they do that, it will get rid of a lot of the bone-on-bone -bone interactions that are so difficult. So holding doors open for people, picking up some package when it starts to fall down, um, calling a, an ambulance when somebody turns out to be ill, these kinds of things most people are willing to do. And what we really need to do is to create civic institutions which stress the importance of those kinds of behaviors. And I do think in the United States, in most communities, those kinds of things happen. And I've seen it countless times myself when people are in airports, when somebody's in distress. Instead of seeing a hundred people run in the opposite direction, you see them all coming there and then you try to figure out who's going to take care of the situation. So I think the civil culture here, and I dare say in Canada, is pretty good on that score. China is in a series of very rapid transition. There's a huge amount of suspicion of government. Uh, so that I think that they have a ways to go before they can develop these sort of essential attributes of what we'd like to call a common and shared humane culture. And Professor, here's a, uh, a very interesting suggestion that we got um, to quiz you on um, 10 topics. If you had to speak to the next president, president-elect, president or the incumbent re-elected in that blessed period, you know, the first 100 days when something can really be done, let's say you're called into the Oval Office and he shoots 10 words at you and you react quickly with a libertarian point of view, nonpartisan, but libertarian, telling him what you think he should do, what's best for America. And, and the first one would be jobs. Oh, yeah, I have a very strong view on that question. Uh, there are two ways you could try to create jobs. One is to give stimulus plans and subsidies and gimmicks of one kind or another. That never works. In order to give a subsidy to one, you have to impose a tax on the other. So you create a job through A and you kill two jobs through B. Uh, the first advice there is look at every single statute which restricts freedom of contract, which is not related to fraud prevention, and figure out how you can repeal it. And on this issue, for example, get rid of most of the anti-discrimination laws, get rid of all the compulsory labor statutes, abolish the minimum wage. The president's going to say this is highly unrealistic given the political interest. And my view is that's your goal and the political question is how you could get closer to that. And that means at the very least you don't want to strengthen the kinds of laws that are going to be completely destructive. My own empirical estimation of this is that if you could really ratchet down the barriers to freedom of contract in labor markets, the employment problem would be cut into half. 
and that would mean that there'd be much less money spent on unemployment benefits and so forth, much higher tax revenues from the profits and from the um, income that are generated by these arrangements, and you could turn these things around. Oddly enough, I think the Canadian situation today is much better on this issue than the American. Um, we have to be able to reverse that, and it's got to be a bipartisan effort. Okay. And then the president looks at you again and says, what do I do about bailouts? Well, as generally speaking, is you don't want to run them if you could possibly avoid them, because the moment you tell at the back end that you're going to bail people out, people will be reckless at the front end. The second piece of advice to give them is you have to run a bailout, do it straight. One of the great scandals with respect to the GM and Chrysler bailouts is they read every known rule of bankruptcy so as to essentially create a bailout for the union creditors who were unsecured and gave them priorities to the secured creditors, many of whom represented state governments who had, of course, union members who were there. So when you try to play the distributional game and mess up the way in which you go, it's always going to be a mistake. Use regular bankruptcy procedures, no ad hoc stuff, and you'll do a lot better than you can if you make this into a political football. So the fact that GM reimbursed the federal bailout money is, is, is not such a big deal then. It was made into a, a huge triumph. Well, GM is, is, is a classic illustration of failure for another reason. 1979, it had about a half a million employees, many of them union laborers. By the time we had bailed this thing out, it was about one-tenth its original size because it was a combination of mismanagement and stupid regulations on them and, most importantly, terrible labor contracts had really reduced them to a core of itself. They are now a pretty good company. They could have been a pretty good company if they had done a decent bailout with the correct priorities rather than running through this political arrangement which was orchestrated in the White House. All right. And then the president says, okay, number three, the public debt. And he looks really worried. Well, he ought to be really worried because one has to try to figure out a way in which to constrain it. But the debt itself is a second-order problem. The first-order problem is spending. You can only fund spending in one of three ways, either by debt, by taxation, or by inflation. And you're gonna, all of them are going to be extremely uncomfortable. So the key feature is you have to be able to control things on the expenditure side, which will mean that the need to take resources into the public sector will be reduced. And where do you have to start? You have to start with the rationalization of entitlement programs. In many of these cases, what's so extraordinary is that we have programs which are run on technologies that are 40 years old. So if you're trying to figure out how you're supposed to use email if you're running a Medicare system, the answer is you don't know the answer to that because nobody's ever tried. And fundamental restructuring of these programs will probably go a long way to save money even if you didn't cover entitlements. And then you should cut entitlements mainly by trying to have co-payment positions in there. The ideal plan or the best plan that I've seen is the one that Mitch Daniels has put into place in Indiana and what it does in effect is it gives people three thousand dollars a year. If they don't spend it on medical care they could keep it. That has a wonderful tendency to conserve resources in ordinary interactions. Then there's a copay period for a few other dollars so that you have to pay some money and then when you get the catastrophic insurance say above the ten or twelve thousand dollar a year benefit uh, you get yourself full government protection. The key feature of that is you don't change the underlying institutions when you infuse the cash, whereas the recent Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act is a disaster on all these scores. It neither protects patients nor does it turn out to be affordable. It has the most dizzying array of restrictions on freedom of contract, the most upside-down interpretation of standard insurance principles, and by the time this thing is put into place, if it is put into place, it will essentially uh, rob the United States of a large fraction of, American, of medical care. The Canadian system, which I'm not a fan of, is much less intrusive because essentially the central government allocates by budget certain sums to the provinces and then they enter, enter the contracts with various providers. It's not a perfect system, but it's leagues ahead of what we're doing in the United States. Yes, and, and, and then, number four, the president says to you, what do I do about taxes? Well, on this issue, again, I, I, I'm a strong partisan of one position. You want to have as few tax instruments as, policy, as possible, and you want them to be essentially as simple as possible. I have always been a long-time defender of what you would call a flat tax on consumption, which means that capital gains transactions get zero, transaction, zero taxation. What you do on So you're saying a, a sales tax? 
No, you could either do it as an income tax, which is flat, or a value-added tax. The form really doesn't matter, but the key feature is the moment you start to use these things in a steeply progressive nature, first of all, you kill incentives in production so you get less wealth. Secondly, you get a huge amount of political uncertainty to figure out just how progressive the system ought to be, which means, for example, in the United States that every two years you have to renegotiate the tax rates. Third, you get all sorts of inconsistent systems of taxations which create their own distortions, of which the death tax turns out to be um, the last one. And fourth, to administer a progressive tax, you have to have so many adjustments with respect to partnerships and multi-year transactions that the administrative costs just overwhelm everybody. Keep it simple, stupid is a very good maxim for a president. And every nation, mostly small nations, that have tried the progressive tax, rather the flat tax, have found that the revenue improvements are so great that they could actually reduce the rates. And that's not an exaggeration. No, it's not an exaggeration. Um, the current American course of going after the top 1% is disastrous. Right now, if you look at that group, the income that they've earned has dropped by 30% since 2007. And uh, so you raise the tax on that, you're going to get even less money out of that group because many of its members will disappear. Um, if you want to tax Warren Buffett, I think that's just retribution for a man whose positions are ill thought out. He doesn't know anything about taxation. He should stick to investment. Well, Professor Epstein, you have the president's attention. This is, this is a lot of fun. So please stay there. And in the next episode, we'll do the next, the missing six points. My pleasure. Richard Epstein was our guest this week on the Free Markets series of The World Show. I'm Bob Scully. Have a great week. Thanks. Mm -hmm.